64 punches thrown in the first 10 minutes. That's what one journalist counted in the match between the New Zealand Cavaliers and Natal, their seventh match in Durban on 13th May 1986. Welcome back to my channel and the sixth in a series of videos about the Rebel New Zealand Cavaliers Tour to South Africa in 1986. I will look at the match between the Cavaliers and Atoll, the teams involved, the lead up to the game, the brawls that broke out and the reactions and media coverage after the match. Please subscribe to my channel to follow the rest of the series. The match against Natal would again grab front page headlines and was called the Durban Brawl. Former Springbok fly off Keith Oxley described the fighting in this match as the worst he had ever seen and the referee Steve Stratham was widely criticised for just standing by whilst both teams had a go at one another. New Zealand Cavaliers was desperate for a win to put their tour back on track after the narrow loss in the first test. It provided an opportunity for many of the players to stake a claim to be included in the team for the second test, to be played at the same venue just three days later. Some of, some of these players were Dave Loveridge at Scrum Off, centre Steve Pokere and fullback Robbie Deans. It also, would also be a test of the leadership of Jack Hobbs, who was not included in the team for the first test. Natal those days played in the Karika B section and nobody gave them a chance to beat the Cavaliers. It was before their later glory days as the KwaZulu Natal Sharks and the team included only a few players that people outside of KwaZulu Natal would recognize. The few notables were fullback Yuris Edwards, who would become a Springbok in 1992, wing Tony Watson, who scored in their shock win against Northern Transvaal in 1990 to win the Curry Cup for the first time, scum off Greg Jamison, who was the captain on that day against Northern Transvaal, and flanker Graham Heerfer. Heerfer missed that fateful match after tearing his ligaments earlier in the 1990 season. One down in the series, the New Zealanders moved on to steamy Durban to prepare for the second test. But before that, they would face Natal in a match that was to grab front page headlines. The match was not televised because the stadium lights at Kings Park were not good enough. It's hard to believe today that in those days an international test venue would not have good enough lighting for a match of this calibre. There is therefore no available footage of the actual match other than the fighting that broke out. News reports indicate that apart from the fighting, it was an entertaining match with the Cavaliers scoring seven tries against the two of Natal. Dave Lovelich increased his chances to be selected for the second test and so did Lock Gary Whitten and Captain Jock Hobbs. Their, their victory was built on driving malls and excellent loose play. They however battled in the lineouts and the scrums. The Natal backline entertained with some flowing moves with Craig Jamison and Henry Coxwell getting their backs going. Natal those days were known for their free-flowing backline play, but were forward packs that could not compete throughout the match. Well, a very hard match, right, from the beginning until the end. Um, I feel like I just didn't give up. And when they got right on top, we managed to come back, but they certainly deserved the win. And hats off to them, they played very well for it. We very much needed to tonight's win because, of course, of the loss on Saturday, we needed to get the tour back on a winning note. So, uh, you know, we're happy to have won. You know, we're not happy with all that was uh, happened out on the field, and uh, but uh, there were some good tries scored. But uh, a so-so effort. For the Cavaliers, wing Bryce Robbins scored three excellent tries, one after a cross kick by Mills. He could have scored a fourth, but dropped the ball over the line. Shelford were rewarded for excellent play with two tries. If Robbie Deans converted more of the tries, the winning margin would have even been greater. For Natal, the two scored just before halftime after he broke around the front of a line-out. Hankinson scored later in the match after a strong run by Cliffy Brown. Constant ugly brawling started at the first scrum of the match barely a minute into the game. Who started the fighting is the story of folklore. Some reports from South Africa, as quoted by Frank Graham Heerfer, indicated that Manny Mix had said before the match that the Natal forward pack was soft and that a punch or two early on would break their spirit. On the New Zealand side, Natal lock Allen here is blamed for throwing the first punch at the first scrum. What followed was a brawl involving all 16 forwards. At the next line-out, another massive brawl ensued. Graham Heerfer said he punched after he was shoved out of the line-out. 
The Cavaliers, on the other hand, the list that Gary Whitten was shoved out of the lineup, leading to the fighting. Perhaps the most endearing image of the match was when the Cavaliers midfielder Bill Osborne chased Jeffer around the field after he struck Shelford across the back of the neck. The whole Cavaliers team chased Jeffer with Osborne in the lead. Jeffer retreated and famously said after the match that he ran away as he is a lover and not a fighter. Jeffer later said that Antal not standing back for the Cavaliers in the fighting surprised them and led to the further incidents. A reporter in New Zealand, however, reported that the heated nature of the game started before either team had even run onto the field. Allegedly, as the teams prepared to run onto the field, the Cavaliers' Maori players in the tunnel were subjected to some racial abuse. This was, however, reported only in one newspaper in New Zealand and is therefore not collaborated. Former Springboks playoff Keith Oxley described the fighting as the worst he'd seen and referee Steve Stratum was widely criticised for standing by. I think probably one or two minor incidents were inflated uh, considerably. I don't think either team should ever join uh, a fracas like that in, the, in numbers that, as they did. And it was probably an unfortunate uh, five or ten minutes of the tour. Uh, one journalist counted 64 punches. I don't know uh, how accurate that would be. But I would say that there were, there were obviously a few incidents there that uh, were not good for the tour, not good for rugby but uh, a very minor part of the tour in terms of the total number of a dozen games played, five or ten minutes of rugby, and probably, as a tour goes, a very, very incident-free, clean tour. Let's talk about those first ten minutes. What happened? Well, I think both sides are keyed up, us being a B-section side. Probably knowing that um, we had nothing going for us as far as support was concerned from the outside people and that uh, nobody really gave us a chance and everyone said, well, they should win, and we knew that. But uh, we certainly weren't going to go there and, and just stand back. And what happened certainly wasn't planned. But with it happening, it just happened and we retaliated or they retaliated. I don't know which side I came from. Those first ten minutes were pretty fiery. Would you like to comment on that? Oh, well, not really, other than to say that it was a very tense start. I think and both sides were very tense. Both sides wanted to play well, do well, and to win. A lot of criticism was put on Steve Stratum because of his control, but I, I think at times like that, um, a referee cannot control that situation. That just blew up um, out of out of his control. There's no way he could have stopped that. I guess um, the incidents that happened later on uh, could have been stopped if maybe if he'd sent a player off from each side. But uh, obviously, he didn't want to do that. But I think um, I think it was overexposed. I know the the first incident was an ugly one, which. Um, no one likes in the game of rugby, or in any sport for that matter. But um, I think after they settled down, there was some good rugby played in it. Preparing for the match against Natal on the fast Kings Park field, the Cavaliers felt that the pitch would suit their fast style of play and forward running malls better than the wet and slow Newlands. They were confident that they could turn things around in the second test. However, Nas Buerta were pointed out as the biggest danger with his kicking at post but also his general tactical play. Their plan was to put pressure on Scrama Ferreira and in this way affect Bota's general play. Prophetic words indeed. Next week we'll look at the second test between the Cavaliers and the Springboks, a do or die game for the Cavaliers, if they were to keep their series hope alive. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and also subscribe to my channel. Cheers.